everybody. Carl Kirby here with Reasons for Hope. And today we're going to take on a topic that I think is fun, quite frankly, and it's about human evolution. Everybody thinks that human evolution is a fact, so we are going to debunk that statement. But before I do it, let me do something here. Please allow me to do a magic trick for you. Okay, I gotta, I gotta set this up, all right? I gotta set this up. I'm gonna put six cards up on the screen. Now, this is very important. You gotta listen to the instructions and you gotta follow them or it's not gonna work. I'm gonna put six cards up on the screen and they're gonna be there for very quick. So when I put those six cards up, face down, I want you to pick one of the cards because they're gonna flip over and flip back. You need to remember the face and the suit. You ready? Here we go. Six cards up. Now, here we go. Pick one, pick one. Remember the face, remember the suit. Now, focus on the red dot. Focus on the red dot. Okay, okay. I'm going to take your card away. I'm bringing back five cards, and guess what? Your card is gone. Did it work? I know it worked. And the reason that I know that it worked is cotton because not one of those cards is the same as the first six cards. People say, how'd you do it? Very simple, just changed all the cards out. Now, what happens though is that when you get in a, a big group and they watch, they're like, what, how, oh, and it's like, it's very simple. Now, why would I do that? Because I wanna make a point to you again. Did you hear the way that I worded that? I was very important, listen to the instructions. If you don't follow the instructions, it's not gonna work. Really? Look, it's gonna work whether you follow the instructions or not because none of those cards are the same. Focus on the red dot. Focus, why, why focus on the red dot? It's a distraction. You need to learn the way that Satan works. And Satan is a master deceiver and throws a lot of information, overwhelms, so it must be true because I don't understand any of this stuff. And we get all these visuals, we get all these images, it must be true. No, it's not that difficult. This is an actual video that I found that's marketing. It's marketing a product. And what's amazing to me is that uh, I see this uh, evolution used in all kinds of products. I've seen it on Wendy's wrappers, McDonald's wrappers. We were walking in Grand Rapids in a mall and there was a, uh, a razor blade store and it had the whole <laughs> ape-like ancestor to human evolution on there for razors. So do you know what product is being marketed here? This isn't like Science Channel or anything like that. This is actually a beer commercial. I reversed the video. So I actually started off where you're a mud skipper and took it to where you're a human. I didn't take you into the bar, but in the actual commercial, you start off in the bar, you take a drink of beer, then you devolve back to the point that you're a mud skipper. Now, let me make an important point to you. If you drink anything that makes you devolve to the point that you're like a mud skipper, you shouldn't drink it. And by the way, if you drink enough beer, you're gonna act like a mud skipper. So just don't go there, all right? But what I'm saying to you is this, is that this message is so prevalent, it's everywhere. But is it the truth? Doesn't matter if it looks good or not. Genesis 1.1 says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. But I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, but Carl, evolution, science, Bible, you can't trust the Bible. Well, one of the things that we do is we love to create the short animated videos that take on these statements that say, well, you can't trust the Bible, it's full of mistakes and errors and that sort of a thing. So they're called debunked. And we're gonna show you one of the debunked videos. Now put your seatbelt on because it's gonna be a little quick. It's extremely popular these days to say the Bible can't be trusted, but really? Now, my goal here is not to give a bunch of proofs like the unassailable prophecy proof, the fact that there are literally hundreds of precise, clear, and specific future events spoken in the Bible, sometimes hundreds of years before they actually happen. You know, no other book can claim that, but who cares? I'm not even going to dig into the internal consistency proof that demonstrates the amazing unity of the Bible, or even its miraculous survival over the centuries. No, 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 no. I'm just going to ask you to be honest and follow along. Let's say you find a piece of paper in a hotel with this written on it. It was at 822 Fifth Street in someplace Texas when Scott somebody was mayor. Jim lived there with his wife and two daughters. Most people called him Little Jim. He liked to wear a gray baseball cap and blue overalls. He was a manager of a place called Corner Pantry where he worked for a long time. The town called him a hero because he fought in a war. He's also a hero because one rainy day he lifted a huge car off of a child all by himself. He died on April 4th, 1990. 500 people were at his funeral. Signed, Polly. That's it. 
Now, what part do you believe and what part are you skeptical about? If you are skeptical, why? Because you automatically rule out certain kinds of things because a professor or friend told you something? Or did you investigate for yourself? Hey, I'm just asking. Now, for the fun of it, yes, this is actually fun for me. Let's just say you don't believe any of it and you're determined to prove it all wrong. Okay, first thing you do is pop up a map and look for someplace Texas. Well, there it is. It's a real place. You go there and find 822 Fifth Street. Facts are checking out, but you're not easily fooled. You go to the local newspaper archives and you find that Scott somebody was indeed the mayor and you see little Jim died on April 4th, 1990. The article also mentions his service in the army and that around 500 people were at little Jim's funeral. But wait a second. You notice the word manager is misspelled on that piece of paper and two words were misread. Trickery, you shout. This writer has concocted a story to fool us and somehow got all these things to line up with their foolhardy fabrication. You don't have a motive or a reason, but come on. You're not going to let this deplorable, downright dubious dummy deceive a determined decoder destined to demystify delirious drivel. So you focus on the car lifting scenario. If you can disprove that, you assume Assume for some arbitrary reason, the whole story is a lie. So you locate an old storage place that one of Lil Jim's daughters rents. You find a drawing of a man lifting a car off a girl, a license plate, and another piece of paper that says, thank you, dad, for saving my sister's life. I saw a miracle that day. You ponder for a moment, then consider the best explanation. Well, I think you get where I'm going. The Bible is much like Polly's letter, citing names, places, and events which can be investigated. So happens over 25,000 archaeological finds have confirmed people, places, and events in the Bible. Not one has ever refuted it. Then we have the question of motive. Why would Polly put all these facts in her letter then lie or somehow make a mistake about the most important part of the story that she saw with her own eyes? Even more, how is it that the writers of the Bible get all the common things right, but somehow get the uncommon things wrong, especially the New Testament writers whose lives were on the line? I mean, would you put your life on the line and testify to something you were unsure about or knew was a lie? No way, not a chance. No, these writers, like honest historical writers, other ancient biographers or dutiful journalists today recorded what they witnessed, what they heard from eyewitnesses, what they investigated, and what was passed down to them from trustworthy people. They weren't tricked, fooled, mistaken, or making stuff up. Just listen. Now the rest of the acts of Jeroboam, how he warred and how he reigned, behold, they are written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Simple and straightforward, right? This is how most of the Bible is written. Don't believe me? Read it for yourself. But suffice to say, this ridiculous assertion, this unjustified claim that the Bible can't be trusted has been debunked. Adios. So again, I know that they're fast, I know there's a lot of information, so hopefully they're done well enough that you'll watch it again and glean some more information. And if you'd like to receive them for free, all we tell you to do is take out your smart device, message us, send the message adios, VCY, to the recipient 51555. You'll get all of the current debunked videos. In addition, you'll get all the future debunked videos that we release, as well as the debunked TV where we flesh out these videos. But let's jump into this issue today. We got to continue on. God said, this is an interesting and an extremely important point. In Genesis 126, it says, God said, let us make man in our image. That little two word phrase, we just kind of run by. Do you, do you know what the implications are? The Bible doesn't claim to be a good book. God said, God breathed. This means that the word of God is directly from God. And that little phrase is used 46 times in the scripture. By the way, over 3,000 times, it claims to be the word of God, not just a good book. And if somebody tries to tell you that Genesis isn't important, of those 46 times that God said is used, 28 of them take place in Genesis. Genesis is written as historical narrative, as real, actual occurrences. And by the way, if Jesus can quote Genesis 25 times and quote it as real history, you better believe that this poor feeble mind right here can take it as real history. And it continues on, it says, God said, let us make man in our image. By the way, if you want value, think about this for a second. Where does our value come from? How pretty, how smart, how talented? No, you are created in the image of God. You are fearfully, wonderfully made. You were literally knit together in your mother's womb. And it goes on to tell you this. So God created man in his own image and the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Young ladies, let me talk to you for just one second. We live in a world that is just distorting, distorting your value. Your value, you believe, from what the world is telling you, is how pretty you are, how smart you are, how well you look compared to a billboard. Please watch this video. 
This is a Dove commercial. I think they did us a great service by showing this. This is the process by which you get the images on a billboard. If you think your value is based on how well you look compared to a billboard, you can never measure up. She comes in, she sits down, they do the makeup, they do the hair, they take the photographs, and then they put it on the computer. And watch what happens. Young lady, your value has nothing to do with how well you look compared to a billboard because you could never measure up. Your value has everything to do with the fact that the one who created you loved you so much that while you rejected him, while you said no thank you, he came and he died for you. I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but you need to know the truth. And when you look at the truth, what you see on a billboard is a far cry from it. And I mean no disrespect to this young lady. Do not be deceived by the world. Satan is the father of lies and he doesn't play fair. You see, the world tells us that we get here by slow, gradual processes over millions of years and this thing turning into this thing and this turning into this thing. And by the way, if that worldview is true, if it were true, and there is no God and we got here by this process, then where does our value come from? If this history is true, then it is based on how pretty, how smart, how talented. Praise God that it's not. But what's the evidence to support this progression? Let's take a listen to a non-Christian here. And he says this, there's a popular image of human evolution that you'll find all over the place. On the left of the picture, there's an ape, on the right, a man. Between the two is a succession of figures that become ever more like humans. Our progress from ape to human looks so smooth, so tidy. It's such a beguiling image that even the experts are loath to let it go, but it is an illusion. I told you in another session that I love illusions, but I will not put my eternal salvation on an illusion and neither should you. See, the truth is the evidence doesn't support it. And I want to show that to you. I'm going to take you to Mr. Crottenmaker. He wrote an article in USA Today where he said this, do religious believers really want the truth of their faith wagered on an attempt to prove that countless scientists have somehow botched the reading of the fossil record? Yes. I am praying that if you have watched the uh, fossil talk and then you're watching this talk at the end of it, you would say, yeah, I'm in. Absolutely. He continues on. Creationist. Now hold up. I am one, but I wasn't raised a creationist. I, God creating, I didn't even hear anything really about until I was like 27 years old. I came to be a creationist because I was challenged to look at the evidence, which is what I want to do to you. Go look at the evidence and see if what we're observing in the world around us is consistent with the Word of God or not. Creationist, uh, creationists ultimately are not interested in science. Here's one of the best tools that I think I can give you, and it's free. Go to your app store, type in 1828, the year, 1828, 1828 Dictionary. There's going to be like three apps that come up. One is a buck 99, one's 399, one is free. Get the free one. It doesn't look as pretty, but it's, you just want the tool. Download that 1828 Dictionary, type in the word science in an 1828 Dictionary, compare it with a modern day def uh, definition of science, and you know what you're going to find? The reason that non-Christians can say that Christians don't do science is they have redefined the term. What gives them the right to redefine the term? The fact that there's 400,000 churches across the nation of America that have, by and large, Monday through Saturday, we've disappeared in the culture. We absolutely care about science. You go study the founders of almost every branch of science, and you're not going to find just Christians, you're going to find creationists. The whole concept was, if you want to understand the creator, Study the creation because his attributes will be in what he made. We care deeply about science, just not the current definition, which has changed. Now, let's do this last part here. Let's try and do this, honestly, with all of our heart. In setting aside preconceptions and following trails of observable evidence to logical, testable conclusions. Again, we're using the secular sources, which we need to do, teach a generation how to look at these things and critically evaluate. When we set aside our preconceived ideas, does the observational evidence lead us to walking with cavemen or does it lead us to in the beginning God? That's a decision that I'm going to leave in your hand. But in this session, we're going to address two of the supposed ancestors. Now, if you want to give me three hours of your life, we'll go through all 17 of the supposed ancestors that you see at the Smithsonian, uh, Smithsonian Museum of Natural History. But I don't think you want to give me three hours. So we're just going to go through this here today. Number one is Ida. Do you remember Ida? Ida was so huge, she got her own TV show, she had a doll, she had a book, uh, you know, The Link. I mean, the headlines were huge. She even got her picture on Google, come on now. 
If you get your picture on Google, you are big time. And when you read the headlines, I mean, we might as well go home. Missing link found. Man, they have the missing link, Carl. What are we going to do as a Christian? They actually have the evidence to support it now. Uh, another headline, scientists unveil the missing link in evolution. What could we do? Set aside your preconceived idea. Let's go look at the observational evidence. Let's see what there really is there before we make a decision to chuck God and chuck his word. Here's a website for you. Now remember, they had the TV show called The Link. They also had a book called The Link. They had a t-shirt that said The Link, and they have a website. And do you know what the address, the URL is for the website? No, not The Link. It is actually revealingthelink.com. So I give that to you so you can go check it out for yourself. And when you go there, here's what you're going to find. You've got uh, amazing information, and, and, and we read this that says that this picture will probably be uh, pictured in, I'm sorry, this fossil will probably be pictured in all the textbooks for the next hundred years. Whoa, this is big. And, and, and this gentleman, I mean, hang on now. When our results are published, it will be just like an asteroid hitting the earth. Is that big? Man, that's huge. Oh, and here's another quote, here's another quote. This fossil rewrites our understanding of the evolution of primates. Well, thanks for joining us. This is going to be a short session today because, no, no, we're going to keep going. Please stick with us. Let's dig a little deeper because on that website, you're going to see this really cool little button over here that says, from Eda to us. When you push on that, it takes you to, uh-oh, the chart. Take a look at our talk that we did on the fossils, the phylogenetic chart showing the progression. And on the far left, there's Ida. She is the link. From her, we got apes and humans, and what are we going to do? Well, we go back to the website, and, and we see Sir David Attenborough. Now, I have to admit I'm a little sad here, because Sir David has, like, the greatest voice of all time. And I want you to hear, if you see any show coming out of England, uh, BBC dealing with evolution, he's the official voice of evolution in England. Take a listen to what he has to say. Now people can say, okay, you say we're, we're, we're primates, like monkeys and apes, uh, and that we came from very uh, simple, generalized uh, mammals. Show us the link. The link, they would have said, until now, is missing. Uh, well, it is no longer missing. Well, I guess we need to quit again because Sir David has spoken and no, we're going to keep going even further. Now, this is an hour and a half program and I'm kind of a weird one. You don't really want to watch a TV show with me because when I watch TV, I like pick everything apart. I drive my children crazy. It's like, Dad, just watch the show. I can't. I can't. It's like I'm watching these things and they're communicating messages and I want to, I want to, I want to catch them. And so uh, as I was watching this show, I was making the, these little weird noise like, uh, uh. I know I shouldn't do that, but I want to show you a montage. This next clip is a montage. Okay. So snippets put together from this hour and a half program because the name of the show was The Link. Yes. Thank you very much for remembering. And, and, and in this show called The Link, I kept hearing these words that were like, what? Huh? I'll show them to you. Don't make any noises. But if you did, I wouldn't hear you. Take a listen. The team thinks they believe it could shed new light on human evolution. She seems to be a bit of both. This could be it. It could help science. Could everyone on the planet be connected to this amazing find? Could hold the clue to link Ida to man. Could reveal her ancient behavior. It could shine a light deeper into our history than ever before could show whether it's a link to man's early evolution. They may have found the first ever link to human beings. Did you catch anything? This is how bad I am. I ordered a transcript of the TV show and I went through and counted how many times they said it could be, it might be, it may be, it seems to be. It's huge. If you think that video was long, I could make it three times longer than what it is on this show called The Link, I had to hear how many times it could be, it might be, it may be. Guys, we need to dig deeper because when Mr. Crottenmaker says we don't want to set aside our preconceived ideas, I'm going to show to you that that is not the case. So let's go back to their site, let's look at the evidence and dig. There it is, there's the actual fossil evidence. Now we're in trouble, Carl. They got a lot of evidence there. And let's look at what they say. Her anatomy has remarkable similarities to our own. Uh-oh, we're in trouble. Ida looks like us. What are we going to do? Let's take a listen 
at exactly how closely she does look like us from the guy who bought the fossil. Take a listen. When you look at the fossil for the first time and you get an impression of the completeness and you start to look at all the, the different details on this, uh, on this fossil, it's a quite short face. It's not like a very elongated face like you see in most lemurs. And that's, that's comparable almost to us because we got a very, very flat face. What are we going to do? Eat has got a short face like ours. Set aside your preconceived idea. Go back to the evidence. Let's push on that really cool little interactive button, and it blows the skull up. And take a look there. Uh oh, you see what it says? Eda has a short face like ours, not the elongated face of a lemur. Now, if there are any teachers watching this, I apologize. I will spend the rest of my life apologizing to teachers. I want you to think about your worst student ever and put him on steroids. He doesn't hold a candle to me. I'm telling you, I was like the worst student ever because this thing doesn't turn off. My mind is constantly running. And, and I have seen the tops of so many teachers' heads in my day. It's embarrassing. And it's not because I'm tall. It's because teachers would say something, and when they did, my hand would go up. And do you know where their head went when my hand went up? What, Carl? I am that guy. He's telling me that she's got a flat face like ours? Okay. I took a human skull and compared it with Ida's skull. Then I took a lemur skull and I compared it with her skull. Sure enough, looks like us. Guys, this is their 3D reconstruction of Ida's skull. And I'll just do it. I'll just put it out there. If anybody out there looks like or has a family member that looks like this, I apologize. If you got a mug like this, you need help. This is not human at all. This is lemur as lemur gets. I've told you before, we don't have an evidence problem. We have an interpretation of evidence problem. But there must be something else that we look like her for. I mean, they said we've got a lot of remarkable similarities. Take a listen. When you're looking at the whole body, you can look at the quite short arms, quite short legs. Not this very, very long legs and arms. Quite a small, compact body like us. What are we going to do? Edith's got two arms like us. Edith's got two legs like us. What could we ever do? Well, let's go back to the evidence, push on the cool little interactive button, and uh-oh, uh now we're in trouble. Take a look there. Eda actually has two arms just like a lemur. Guys, that's lemur, <laughs> lemur gets. There's nothing human about that. Oh, hang on to this. You think, I, you think I, I, I've got a wrong interpretation? Take a listen to this next clip. Creating an accurate 3D model of Ida. Now the team can compare her skeletal anatomy with living animals in minute detail. Her body proportions and finger length suggest she's a lemur. Did you catch that? She looks like us, but her body proportions suggest she's a lemur. And not just once, in the exact same program. But her body proportions and the length of her fingers are like a lemur's. You see, that's talking out of both sides of your mouth. Oh, she's like us, she's like us, but her body proportions suggest she's a lemur. Guys, there's one more piece of deception going on here that we have got to notice. If you look at the way that they depict Ida, She's not standing fully upright, but she's not all the way bent over like a monkey. Monkeys are quadrupeds walking on all fours. Humans are, most of us, bipedal walking up on two legs. How do you know if you have a missing link? Very simple. Something that looks like an ape, but walks like a human. And look at Ida. She fits the bill. She's not fully upright. She's two-thirds of the way upright. What are we going to do? Set aside your preconceived idea. Take a listen where they, in their show, compare the skeletal structure of Ida with chimpanzees. And they say this. They are quadrupeds, walking on all fours, as she would have done in the... Okay, chimpanzees are quadrupeds, walking on all fours, as she would have done. So Ida was a quadruped, knuckle-dragger. Why do they show her walking two-thirds of the way upright? Because you're being lied to, period. Well, there's got to be some more similarities. Let's take a listen. 
You can see that it's got five fingers, of course, and nails on all the fingers. But also, the thumb is opposable like us. So it can grasp things, it can hold things the same way we do today. It's already there 47 million years ago. It's a, it's a, it's a proper hand to hold around things. What are we going to do? Edith's got five fingers like us, she's got nails like us, she's got a thumb like us. And you read what they say here, she has certain undeniable human characteristics such as forward-facing eyes and an opposable thumb. What are we going to do? Ida looks like us. Let's go take a look at that hand. There it is, cool interactive uh, uh, model again. You push the button and there it is. Ida, sure enough, she's got five fingers, she's got nails, she's got a thumb that looks just like a lemur. And by the way, if you want me to quit talking on this topic, I'm very happy to do so. All you need to do to prove me wrong is show me anybody in your family with a foot like this. Ida's foot is totally lemur. If anybody in your family can hang by their toes from a bar, you win. I'm done. But, 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 but Carl, Ida has forward-facing eyes. That's an undeniable human characteristic. Ida has forward-facing eyes. What are you going to do? She has forward-facing eyes just like a lemur. Guys, this is the link. Sir David, the link is no longer missing. What are we going to do? Give it up and go home? No. Be patient, give science time, they'll catch up to reality. I tell this to folks all the time. When you see something in the news of the latest missing link, put it on your digital calendar, electronic calendar, so that, uh, and put yourself a reminder on there. So 11 months later, uh, you get a tickler to say, hey, go do some more study on this, see where it stands. Because typically, 11 months after you get this big headline and really cool video and front page news, 11 months later, gone. It didn't take 11 months for Ida. Literally within three days, the report started coming out. Scientists divided on EDA as the missing link. Why EDA fossil is not the missing link? In order to establish that connection, EDA would have had to have had anthropoid-like features that evolved after anthropoids spit away from lemurs and other early primates. Here, alas, EDA fails miserably, so EDA is not the missing link. I mean, uh, let's go to a conservative source, MSNBC. That's a joke. But look, when, MSA, when MSNBC calls you out and they're on your side, it's not a good day. The three people that read this article were shocked. Missing link primate isn't a link after all. Remember Eda, the fossil discovery announced last May with its own book and TV documentary? A publicity blitz called it the link. Did you hear that? That's exactly what it was. It was a publicity blitz. Because what you need to know is like Yorn, the guy that talks about this fossil the whole show, he, he didn't discover it. It had been found over 20 years prior, held in a private collection, and Yorn bought it. He raised enough money to buy the thing, study it in secret for two years, and then released the findings, and oh, you're never gonna believe this. What a coincidence. They released the video, they released the book, the plush doll, the shirts, and everything, and it just so happens to coincide with the 150th anniversary of the publication of Origin of Species. Can you believe that? Unbelievable, wow, what? A coincidence. It was a publicity blitz. And it gets worse. It continues on to say this, that uh, experts protested Eda wasn't even a close relative, and now a new analysis supports their reaction. The new analysis says that it's actually as far removed from the monkey ape human ancestry as a primate can be. So when Mr. Crotmaker wants to tell me that we're not willing to set aside our preconceived ideas to follow the observational evidence to his logical, testable conclusion, that's not true. Here's the actual evidence that they have to support this position of ape-like ancestor evolving into humans. It's part of our evolution that's been hidden so far. It's been hidden because all the other specimens are so incomplete. They are so broken. There's almost nothing to study. That's why I said, give me three hours of your life and we'll go through all 17 of the supposed ancestors and deal with them. But hold up. Yorn, he was on the show. This fossil is going to be pictured in the textbooks for the next hundred years. It's in the museum in Denver, Denver Museum of Natural History. It is in there. This is evidence for human evolution. You know my biggest problem with all of this? They sold the book, The Link. They gave us the TV show called The Link. And he knew that it wasn't a link. He knew it. Let me prove it to you. We are, of course, not stating that this is the, our direct ancestor. That's too much. 
excuse me? The name of the book was The Link. The t-shirt was The Link. When you go look at the advertisement, what does it say? What about The Link? It's missing link found, human ancestor, human evolution. He knew it wasn't the link. He knew it when they put all of this information out there, but he still put it out. Take a listen to one of the other people that worked on the fossils with him, the dream team. Take a listen. It's not a direct ancestor of monkeys and humans, but researchers say it provides a good indication of what such an ancestor may have looked like. It is a member of the ancestors. We could call it, if we would put it familiarly, uh, we are not dealing with our grand, 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 grandmother, but perhaps with our grand, grand, grand aunt. That's as clear as mud. So this is our ancestor? No, it's not our ancestor, but it's being taught to a generation that it's their ancestor. If you get the DVD and you read the, what they write about it, take a listen to what they still say. Scientists have discovered the oldest and most complete fossil of a human ancestor. They know it's not in the human lineage, but they'll still sell you the DVD as such. And it goes on to say this, the the, uh, I'm sorry, the fossil's remarkable state of preservation allows an unprecedented glimpse into early human evolution. If it's not in our lineage, it can't show you anything about early human evolution. I want you to hear what the whole goal was behind this thing. Having previously experienced how the blogosphere had picked up on his work and seen Chinese dinosaur finds the object of bad early descriptions from blogging, Yorn decided to orchestrate launch of the fossil in a combined uh, to orchestrate the launch of the fossil in a combined scientific and public event. Atlantic Productions, which had cooperated with them on a Predator X, a giant plasaur from Svelbard, was brought in on the project in order to, take a listen now, take the story straight to the masses in a way that would appeal to the average person, especially kids. Why did our ministry make a decision to go purposefully after this younger generation? Because the world is. And the world's not playing fair. And they're being fed a line and they don't know how to deal with it. They are coming after the younger generation. We have to pray for them. We have to go after them. Not pulling punches, not watering down, not making excuses for the Bible, teaching how to use it as an authority. Listen to what he says here. No, I do not regret the media blitz at all. Eda is still one of the most iconic fossils and the only complete primate fossil ever. Whether or not she is a direct ancestor, something we never claimed in the scientific paper. Hear me on this. How many people especially younger generation, do you think read the scientific paper? Nil? How many saw and still see the TV show? A lot. This is hypocrisy at the highest level. Oh, we didn't say it in the scientific publication. You said it in the TV program. Satan doesn't play fair. She is undoubtedly the only fossil that tells us what an early primate really looked like. Other fossils are mostly fragments. And it gets even better. Last quote. Any pop band is doing the same thing. Any athlete is doing the same thing. We have to start thinking the same way in science. You see, I was taught science was using your five senses in the present to make an observation, come up with a hypothesis, test all this, and then go through this whole scientific method over and over again. This is not that. This is marketing, a message. If you redefine terms, of course we can't compete with that. Of course they can diminish Christians and Christianity because, oh, they're those people. But we have truth. And when we start with the truth and look at the world around us and show what the Word of God says and what we actually see, you got nothing to be ashamed of. One last point here. Uh, remember the quote? This fossil rewrites our understanding of the evolution of primates. Now, now let me make a point to you here. The science textbooks that are being used today, do they teach the same thing as five years ago? Ten years ago? Fifty years ago? A hundred years ago? And the answer is, of course, no. Word of God. Does it teach the same thing as five years ago? Ten years ago? Fifty years ago? A hundred years ago? Yes. Then why is it that 50 to 88% of the younger generation are walking away from the Lord Jesus Christ for a system that every time they find a new rock somewhere, it changes everything we've known to be a fact? Why? I want to suggest to you it's because we're not teaching this generation how to think. We're teaching them what to think. 
Now, one more ancestor. The most famous of all the ancestors, Lucy. What are we going to do? Lucy was so special, she didn't just get her picture on Google. She got an animated GIF. So this is big time. What are we going to do? And, and, and there's plenty of pictures of Lucy. I mean, Carl, there you go. That's an evolutionary ancestor right there, walking like a human, looking like an ape. I mean, from the neck up, that is one ugly woman. I'm just being honest with you, okay? From the neck down, looking mighty human, except for when she had a bad hair day, it was all over her body, and that's not a good thing for a lady. I'm just saying. What are we going to do, Carl? That's an evolutionary ancestor if I ever saw one. What's the actual evidence? Let's go take a look at it. Here's what they have. Now, there's two important points I want to make about Lucy. Number one, Lucy wasn't even a she. Lucy was a he. <laughs> yeah, her bones, they figured out after 40 years of study that Lucy wasn't a she. Two Swiss scientists figured out that she was a he. And those Swiss scientists suggested a new name. They suggested Lucifer. Now, I did say amen to that because this is a set of bones that's been used more by Satan to light us than any other set of bones going. And point number two, oh, she's 40% complete. Remember the quotes that we read? Oh, they're only fragments. There's so little information to study. Very true, but not Lucy. Oh, boy, we have 40%. Not true. There are 206 bones in the adult, ape, and human body. If you start counting the bones up here, feel free, um, you're not going to find 40%. The vast majority of bones in the human body and ape body are in the hands and in the feet. And if you look carefully, you're going to see that they didn't find any hand or foot bones for the specimen Lucy. Now, this is an important point. Please stick with me. Lucy is an individual within a family. I am an individual within the human family. Lucy, they found her bones and her bones did not contain any hand or foot bones. But they did find hand and foot bones from her supposed relatives. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So 40% uh, complete, that's not true. If you start counting the bones, oh, you're going to get probably about 20%, which is still good compared to just pieces of a bone. I mean, bone fragments, like next to nothing. Why the exaggeration? This is an important point. With Lucy, why do you have to exaggerate? Hey, this is still really good compared to these other things. Satan is a braggart. Now, one more point I want to give you, though. This is kind of interesting. One of the bones that they did find actually turned out to belong to a baboon. So they actually lost one of the bones. It just took a few years of study to figure out that uh, not only was she a he, but one of the bones they found belonged to a baboon and just kind of got mixed in. Interesting quote. If the fragment really does prove to belong to a baboon, he says, we can cut Don Johansson and his colleagues some slack. Okay, cut them some slack. But it still doesn't prove that this thing is a human ancestor. You know, I, I, I just find this interesting. Look at the skull pieces that they have there. You count them out. You know, you've got just a few skull pieces. I want you to see the reconstruction from those pieces. This is what the reconstruction looked like. Now let's listen to one of the guys who worked on those, uh, these fossils to see what he says about the skull of Lucy's species. As we uh, assemble larger pieces from smaller pieces, joining them together, we begin to get a fairly impressive picture of a species that has a very ape-like face with uh, big protruding brow ridges. Very so according to the individual that worked on the reconstruction of the skull of Lucy species, Australopithecus afarensis, just means southern ape, it was very ape-like, big protruding eyebrow ridges. I want you to see the reconstruction. When you go to the Smithsonian, you see this reconstruction, and look, those eyebrow ridges aren't that big. I mean, it looks human. Where did the human features come from? From the skull that is very ape-like? No, from the individual that made the reconstruction. Take a listen to what he said. I wanted to get a human soul into this ape-like face to indicate something about where he was headed. Excuse me. The evidence was a very ape-like skull, and you know he's headed somewhere. To get a banana is about the only thing that you know he's headed to do. You put the human features in there. And by the way, did you notice one of the features that were there? Oh, did you notice the eyes. Take a look at the eyes. You found seven pieces of a skull and you know that she had human eyeballs? No. 
You don't know that at all. Apes don't have whites around their eyes. How do you know that Lucy had whites around her eyes? They don't. They stuck a human eyeball in there, and that is nothing more than deception. So be careful. Do not be deceived. Now, here's, a, here's an interesting picture, you know. Uh, looky there. Can you, can you take a look at the look on Lucy's face? Is that a proud woman or what? She's looking at her man and boy, she should be proud. Look at the pecs on that guy. And look over here. Here's another lady. She's waving up at the trees. Hey, you got any bananas up there? And look at the, look, look at the face on her child. I mean, those are human features. And if you want to see a future Fortune 500 CEO, this is a man with a vision for the future. You got all this from seven pieces of a skull and you think we Christians have a problem? Christian, we need to stand up and call this out. This is a mess. And I'm going to make another point to you here that might make some of you mad, but I'm just going to make it. Take a look. These are the, some of the supposed relatives of the human race. Notice the further back you go, the darker you are. Now, notice, uh, now hear me on this. Hear me on this, please. I am not saying that evolutionists are necessarily racist, but I will say this. Evolution is a racist philosophy because evolution teaches, as we've said before, that ape-like ancestor evolved into the black folks. Some of those black folks ate fish, spurred brain development, got smart, moved north and turned white. The further back you go, the darker you are. That is racism. God said we all go back to one man and one woman. So be very careful with this stuff, guys. There are implications that you may not even notice, but they're there. Here's another piece. Watch this. You see the jaws right here? Oh, my goodness. On the far left, that's a chimp. On the far right, that's a human. And in the middle, there's Lucy. She is halfway in between apes and humans. She's the missing link. She fits the bill. What are we going to do? Here's what we do. Let me draw a red line down here, horizontal line. And now all we're going to do is I'm not going to change the size, the shape, the structure of the jaws. All I'm going to do is change the placement, the bottom of the molar on the top of the red line. And let's move it up and move the human jaw down. And I'll ask you a question. Does it look so transitional anymore? This is nothing more than a chimpanzee jaw. But if you push one down and move one up, oh, it looks like it's somewhere in between. It is not. It is a chimpanzee jaw. But now let's look at some of the reconstructions of the outside of Lucy. I mean, you have reconstructions from ranging from chimpanzee all the way to orangutan, but all of them depict one thing in common. Lucy walking upright like a human. Why? Because they found totally human footprints. Totally human footprints found in Tanzania. This proves that Lucy walked upright. Uh, by the way, how many foot bones did they find for Lucy? None. And they know that Lucy made this. Why? Oh, because of the dates. That's a different topic that we can go into sometime. But guys, these are totally human footprints. You have something that doesn't have any foot bones, and you know that that thing made this thing. I'm going to say that they know that it didn't, and I'll prove it to you in a second. Stick with me. This is what they say about these footprints, though. Make no mistake about it, they are like modern human footprints. If one were left in the sand of a California beach today and a four-year-old were asked what it was, he would instantly say that somebody had walked there. He wouldn't be able to tell it from a hundred other prints on the beach, nor would you. The external morphology is the same. This is a totally human footprint. Come with me to the Denver Museum of Natural History, take a look at this exhibit. Some feet are made for climbing, some for walking. So you got your chip, you got yourself a human. And then right in between, they say this, and some for both. Hold up. The, the footprint that they found in Tanzania is totally human. Why do they show Lucy's foot halfway in between? You can't put a totally human footprint with a foot that's halfway in between. It doesn't fit at all. How do they know that uh, Lucy was halfway in between like that? They don't. Matter of fact, that's even wrong. And I'll prove it to you. When you uh, used to go to the St. Louis Zoo, they had an exhibit of Lucy there that showed L Lucy with a totally human foot because those footprints were totally human. I mean, a little nair would solve the rest of the problem, but that's a totally human foot. How many bones did they find for Lucy? Remember, none. We have to know that. None. Not a single one. What were the bones, though, that they found from the relatives for the foot? How were they shaped? Were they shaped like a human or were they shaped like a chimpanzee? Interesting. Extinct humans, Ian Tattersall, 
I found this in uh, their book, and he says this. In keeping with Lucy having had long and strongly curved finger and toe bones, as do chimpanzees and orangutans, if you want, I can give you the research that shows that Lucy's relatives had fingers and toes more curved than a chimpanzee. More curved. So when you find totally human footprint, there is no way that Lucy or her relatives made it. None. You can go do the research to prove this for yourself. No chance at all. But here's what I want to do with the remaining time that we have. I want to take you to a TV show that I know is still being used in some of the public schools because when I showed this opening right here, I had a young man raise his hand and said, hey, we just watched that in science class. And I said, what did it show you? Oh, that we evolved from apes. I think we need to look at it closely, all right? Uh, in Search of Human Origins with Don Johansson. Don Johansson is the guy who discovered Lucy. So in this program, PBS Nova made, they just talked about Lucy. Let's listen to it. And by the way, if you'd like to get these clips, all you need to do if you're uh, doing the apps, go to your app store and type in Reasons for Hope. Just spell it out, Reasons for, F-O-R, Hope. And you can download our app. And on there, you'll find the Lucy clips so that you can use them. Because I want you leading tours through the zoos and the museums. And you see this exhibit, I want you to show the videos that I'm going to show you here. Because when you see these things, they do not support what we're being told that it actually supports. So let's take a watch. We needed Owen Lovejoy's expertise again, because the evidence wasn't quite adding up. The knee looked human, but the shape of her hip didn't. Okay, now remember this. In order to know that you have found a missing link, something that is the common ancestor between apes and humans, you need something that walks like a human, but looks like an ape. In order to walk like a human, you have to have knees like a human, you have to have hips like a human. And what did Don Johansson just say? Uh, let's just read. He said that the knee looked human. Did they find a complete knee for Lucy? And the answer is no, they did not. So how do they know that it looked human? Matter of fact, let me take you to a source that really doesn't like Christians very much, and this is what they write. The skeleton called Lucy does not have an intact knee. So my question is, how do they know that it looked human? They do not know that Lucy's knee looked human. He continues on. He said, but the shape of her hip didn't. Okay, what did her shape what did the shape of her hip look like then? Because if she's going to walk upright, it's got to be curved like a human. So how was it curved? Superficially, her hip resembled a chimpanzee's, which meant that Lucy couldn't possibly have walked like a modern human. But Lovejoy noticed something odd about the way the bones had been fossilized. When I put the two parts of the pelvis together that we had, this part of the pelvis has pressed so hard and so completely into this one that it caused it to be broken into a series of individual pieces which were then fused together in later fossilization. All right, we gotta break this down. This is what he said, just making sure I'm getting this right here. Her bones are broken after she died, then fused together in later fossilization. I am not trying to be crude or crass, but when you die, are your bones fusing anymore? No, the decay process kicks in. So how in the world do you break these things and they fuse back together? That doesn't make any sense. And then he said this, her hips look chimp. So the implications are that originally she had hips like a human. Something happened to cause them to look like a chimp. What happened? I'll let him tell you. After Lucy died, some of her bones lying in the mud must have been crushed or broken, perhaps by animals browsing at the lake shore. Uh, this has caused the two bones, in fact, to fit together so well that they're in an anatomically impossible position. Can we talk? Here's the story. Human hip Lucy is taking a stroll down by the lake. She just happens to die. The body lays there. All the flesh rots off. And then a deer just happens to come along and step on her hips, crushing her hips, and then the hip bones fuse back together, no longer looking like a human, but now they look like a chimp. Are you kidding me? Please just think about this for one second. Animal dies down by the lake shore. How long does it have to lay there for all the flesh to rot off? A while. Don't you think in the wild that that thing is laying there and rotten, that scavengers aren't going to come along and start eating on it and dragging the bone parts all over the place? The, the fact that they found all of these bones together in one place shows that it was covered up water by rapidly. Do we have an explanation? Yes, but that's a different talk. 
what we see in the world is consistent with the word, not with this. And, and then he said this, they fit together so well, they were in an anatomically impossible position. I love when they start throwing the big words around and trying to intimidate people. Oh, it's anatomically impossible. Why? Because they're curved like a chimp and she walked like a human. Excuse me, if she was a chimp, her hips should be curved like a chimp. Then there's nothing anatomically impossible about it. By the way, could it fit any better than so well? Listen to this next quote. The perfect fit was an illusion that made Lucy's hip bones seem to flare out like a chimp's. But all was not lost. You heard that. The perfect fit was an illusion. What can you do with something like that? The perfect fit showed she had hips like a chip, but that's an illusion. We don't accept that. And then all was not lost. There's hope. Look, the name of our ministry is Reasons for Hope, and we do. We place our hope in Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed of that. But you've got to understand that he's also placing his hope somewhere. Every one of us place our hope somewhere. And I'm praying that you're putting your hope in Jesus Christ and not this mess you know, uh, I'm going to show you a clip in a second. And, and every time I showed that clip, I've been doing this for a long time. Whenever I showed that clip, my mind, I'm, I'm going to date myself here. My mind would flash back to an old TV show that I grew up watching called The Six Million Dollar Man. Now, I know, I'm dating myself. But Lee Majors, when I was a young man, he was the man. The intro to The Six Million Dollar Man has always flashed in my head. And so let me play this short snippet for you. Gentlemen, we can rebuild him. We have the technology. I love this. We can rebuild him. We have the technology. I wish I had that narrator voice. I want you to see the technology that was used to rebuild Lucy from chimp hip to human hip. Now, you know what? Even though I can't see you right now, I want you to do something for me. If your eyes are still open, I want you to close them. I want you to hear the technology. I'll tell you when to open them. It'll only be about four seconds. Close your eyes and take a listen to the technology that was used to rebuild Lucy. You can open your eyes. Lovejoy decided he could restore the pelvis to its natural shape. He didn't want to tamper with the original, so he made a copy in plaster. He cut the damaged pieces out and put them back together the way they were before Lucy died. It was a tricky job, but after taking the kink out of the pelvis, it all fit together perfectly, like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. As a result, the angle of the hip looks nothing like a chimp's, but a lot like ours. I hope so. If you take a Dremel and cut out the parts that you don't want to be there, it better look like you want it to look like. By the way, do you know what video you don't see when you're standing at the Smithsonian looking at the reconstruction? You don't see these unless I'm there, or you, I pray, are leading towards through there in the future. You, this is what you see, and, and there she is. There's Lucy standing upright with hand bones and foot bones. I told you it takes three hours to go through all 17 of the evolutionary ancestors. I did it with a youth group up in Washington, D.C. Three hours, we went through every one of the ancestors, and then for the next two days, I led them on tours to go to the actual museum and go through that whole Hall of Human Origins section and to deal with it. Two days, all right? Because you've got to take small groups. You can't take a big group. They will throw you out in a heartbeat, man. That, you are walking on holy ground when you walk into this place. Look, my Christians... They have a religion. It's called secularism. It's called atheism. And they don't like it when you come in and teach something different. So we're standing there, and I've got like uh, 10 uh, young ladies, or not young people, young men, young ladies, and they're there, and we're looking at this, and, and I'm pointing out the, the fact that there's a hand bone and a foot bone, and, the, and a docent came over, and he pulled a picture off the top of the case, and he said, look at this. Isn't this amazing? Lucy, she's our ancestor. She looked like us. She walked like us. And I wanted to say something. But I didn't want to say something because I'd spent three hours with these students and I'm praying that one of them would initiate. And sure enough, the young lady raises her hand and she said, sir, we just got done listening to a speaker and he told us they didn't find any hand or foot bones for Lucy and they have a hand and foot bone in there. 
That's correct. But they found some hand and foot bones from her relatives. Another young lady raises her hand and she said, but sir, he told us that the hand and foot bones that they found were actually more curved than a chimpanzee. Oh, I don't know anything about that. But look at her hip. Oh, Lucy had hips just like us. She walked like us. Another young person raises their hand and said, but sir, the speaker told us and showed us that they used a, dr a drummel to cut out the parts that weren't there that it looked like a chimp, and then they used a drummel to cut it out to make it look like a human. And he said, I don't know anything about that. Where are you guys from? I want you to notice something. They were not disrespectful. They were not impolite. They asked good questions. And that young lady said, uh, well, the church down the street, and that guy just turned and walked away. It was unbelievable. They didn't mock. They didn't ridicule. We don't have to do that. I'm not calling for that. We need to know why we believe what we say we believe. We need to be able to give an answer for the reason for the hope that lies within us with meekness and fear. And that's all they did. Look, when Mr. Cottonmaker wants to say that we don't want to set aside our preconceived ideas and follow the observational evidence with logical, testable conclusion, that is not the case. You see, I've got a millstone waiting for me if I'm given false information. That's what God tells me. If I'm leading this younger generation astray and I'm giving them false information, I've got a millstone waiting on me, so I take this very serious. Here's the truth about Lucy, using their sources. And by the way, did you notice this entire episode, the fossil episode, we use the secular sources. We're not running and hiding. We're taking their stuff and critically evaluating it. This is from the Houston Museum of Natural Science. They got the actual bones, Lucy's actual bones, brought them over to America, put them on display, and made a study guide for the people that were going through there, for teachers that were taking all the students through there. I got a copy of that study guide, and this is what it says on page 20. For 20 years, Lucy was thought to be the oldest human-like fossil ever found. Even though older fossils have been found in the past 13 years, Lucy remains the benchmark by which all other discoveries are judged. Lucy has become a household name. But is she a human ancestor? Let's go up to the top of the page and read. For many years, Lucy was thought to be a direct human ancestor, but we now see her as belonging to a separate group of hominids from those which became our species, Homo sapiens. What does that mean? Lucy is not in the human lineage. She's not. Don't trust me? Let's go to another source. Uh, Jerusalem Post. Israeli researchers. Lucy is not a direct ancestor of humans. Let's go look at one of those phylogenetic charts that we talked about in the other episode on fossils. This shows, oh, look, this shows... Yeah, do you know what it shows? Do you see the bold line, actual evidence? Do you see the skinny line with the question marks? If you look, you'll see Australopithecus afarensis. That's Lucy. Notice that she is no longer connected in, leading on to any other line. And as a matter of fact, the missing link, if you go to the right, that's apes. If you go to the left, that's humans. The missing link tying the apes and the humans together, if you look very closely, you see two question marks and a skinny line, which means they have Nothing. 50 to 88% of the younger generation walking away from the Lord Jesus Christ because they think this is science. It's not. It's science fiction. Teach this generation how to think. They have nothing to be ashamed or afraid of. I'm Carl Kirby with Reasons for Hope. Thank you for joining us.